Hello, it's Charlie from Silence to Talkies, with the next episode in a series during which I will investigate why a silent star's talkie stardom did not stick. This episode will focus on Agnes Ayers, one of the loveliest movie stars of the early 1920s that suddenly experienced a sharp career decline after starring in only two talkies in 1929. I've been aware of Agnes's name and stardom for several years due to her starring in the 1921 blockbuster The Chic as Rudolf Valentino's leading lady. However, I didn't know much else about her other than that she reprised her role as Lady Diana Mayo in the 1926 sequel The Son of the Chic, which was even more of a blockbuster than its predecessor due to the tragic, untimely death of Rudolf Valentino. When I began researching and compiling the names of all the silent stars that briefly starred in talkie films, I was intrigued by Agnes's career because she only made two starring appearances in the talkies before resurfacing six years later in uncredited roles. What happened? It clearly was not the same situation as others like Norma Talmadge that made a few talkies or even Gloria Swanson that made a few talkies retired then came back as a star again. Agnes, for some reason, managed to make the transition to talking films and star in two films, but then vanished until six years later when she found only extra and uncredited work. I decided to begin my research, and what I found astounded me. Astounded did me. Sorry. <laughs> More than any other star, or any other actor for that matter, Agnes Ayers was a tough cookie that refused to give up her career without a courageous fight in which she gave everything she had to find the ability to keep acting. Unfortunately, this fight came at the expense of both her mental and physical health. It's a tragic tale, but also an inspiring one, as I have not found an actor as tough as Agnes in my research thus far. But more on that. Later. Journey back with me to Agnes' early life and the dawn of her career. Agnes was born Agnes Eyre Hinkle in 1892 in Illinois to Solon and Emma Hinkle. She was the youngest of two children. Young Agnes left school after 8th grade when her family moved to Chicago, I'm assuming so she could help support her family by working. She eventually found work as a bookkeeper, during which she was spotted by an SNA studio director. SNA was a prominent Chicago film studio in the 19-teens. This director hired Agnes to begin working as an extra on Chicago film shoots. Her first recorded work as an extra for SNA was 1914, when she was 22, so there must have been around eight years of her bookkeeping or other work before she was spotted by SNA. Agnes's second gig at SNA as an extra was His New Job in 1915, the first Charlie Chaplin vehicle at the studio. Charlie had recently left Keystone for SNA. The shoot was in the dead of winter in 1915 in January, and not only included Agnes, but also a young Gloria Swanson, too. Agnes is listed as playing the secretary on IMDb, but as you can see in the following clip, she's more or less a beautiful extra. Take a look. You can see Agnes standing in the back of the crowd as the tramp, Charlie's character, bumbles his way through the movie set twice. It wasn't a huge part, but Agnes was memorable, and I found it easy to pick her out immediately. It's actually incredible that his new job survives, and it's one of the few, if not the only, film of Agnes's early career that was not lost. We probably have the lasting legacy and star power of Charlie Chaplin to thank for that. Agnes and her mother moved to New York in 1917, where she began to find work with mutual studios credited as Agnes Eyre, E-Y-R-E. -E. That's the way her middle name was spelled, like Jane Eyre. At some time during 1917, she was noticed by silent movie star Alice Joyce, who noticed their resemblance to one another. She got Agnes cast as her younger sister in her star vehicle, Richard the Brazen, in 1917. None of the reviews for that film mentioned Agnes by name, but the plot summary did allude to the fact that the role of Imogene was quite substantial. Richard the Brazen led to Agnes getting cast in larger roles at Vitagraph. She followed it up with The Venturers, The Defeat of the City, and The Furnished Room, all of which gave her starring roles and got her the new nickname, The O. Henry Girl since all of the films were adaptations of the author's stories. I couldn't find a lot of information about the commercial or critical successes of these films, but I can only assume by the nickname that Agnes got from them that she was a hit in them. The Bottom of the Well from 1917 was her first starring role outside of an O. Henry story and the first time that Agnes was credited as Agnes Ayers, the way that we know it's spelled today. Agnes also starred in The Renaissance at Ch Charleroi in 1917, which was another O'Henry story and saw her revert back briefly to E-Y-R-E -E again. However, moving into late 1917 to 1918, the new spelling of her last name stuck. She starred in 22 Vitagraph shorts. At least 12 of these shorts were based on O'Henry stories, so it's clear to see why her nickname stuck. Clearly, these also must have been quite popular with audiences since there were so many produced so quickly. 
She also made two feature-length O. Henry films, $1,000 and Maman and the Archer, both in 1918 as well. The New York Times, while not mentioning Agnes, called Maman a pleasant, or Mammon, a pleasant comedy. Agnes entered 1919 supporting Corinne Griffith and The Girl Problem, who, which you'll men remember I mentioned in my episode on Corinne Griffith a few weeks back. And then Agnes made four more O. Henry shorts in 1919. She got another plum supporting role in the Gladys Leslie vehicle, A Stitch of Time, and was a female lead opposite Harry T. Morey in The Gamblers and William Russell in Sacred Silence, which the latter was produced by Fox, probably allowing Agnes to appear on loan out from Vitagraph. She was the female lead opposite Harry T. Morey again and in Honor's Web and moved into 1920 in a supporting role in the Hope Hampton vehicle, a modern Salome, before playing opposite E.K. Lincoln in The Inner Voice. It appears that Agnes left Vitagraph after she made an Honor's Web for reasons unknown. I'm assuming her contract probably ended and she decided to freelance at Metro where she made Salome and at First National where she made the horror sci-fi, frankly, bizarrely interesting film Go Get It, which, she, which was about a Bigfoot-type character that was created when a man's brain was put into a gorilla's skull. Agnes played the female lead, and I assume the damsel in distress. Later in 1920, Agnes got her big break, if you will, when she was given a Paramount contract by founder Jesse Lasky and cast as the lead in Held by the Enemy, her first starring role in which she played the lead heroine. There have been rumors about Agnes's relationship with Lasky, but we're not going to talk about those here. Held by the Enemy was a Civil War drama in which Agnes played Rachel Hayne, a young Southern wife in a loveless marriage that believes her husband, played by Louis Stone, to be dead. She ends up falling in love with a Northern officer played by Jack Holt, who, by the way, she would be teamed with frequently over the next nine years. While I cannot find the box office returns for the film, I can only assume it was a hit. Exhibitors Herald raved about Held by the Enemy and had the following to say about Agnes. Agnes Ayers and Wanda Holly are two of the most appealing young women coupled in this timely screen drama. Their attractiveness, one about which there is certain to be great enthusiasm, and their artistry is noteworthy. Agnes finished up 1920 in The Furnace as Folly Valens, a more villainous type of role and a change of pace for her. Folly marries a man for his money and loves the party life before she learns her lesson at the end and realizes that she really loves him. Exhibitors Herald again gave Agnes rave reviews, and they said, Agnes Ayers' commanding beauty and capabilities on the screen have made her perfectly cast in that role. And later, they added that she and her co-stars Milton Sills and Jerome Patrick gave uncommonly good performances. Another reviewer from Exhibitors Herald gave Agnes this rave about the film. Agnes is coming more and more to the front as a star and is deserving of her success. Agnes's star was one on the rise even more. She entered 1921 as a very popular star and scored her largest role yet in the first major movie star vehicle in her career, Forbidden Fruit, which thankfully still survives and is available to watch on YouTube. As usual, look for links in my YouTube descriptions to see link to see where you can watch Agnes's videos on YouTube and other streaming services. Anyways, in Forbidden Fruit, Agnes played Mary, the seamstress who works for a rich couple played by Kathleen Williams and Theodore Roberts, who gets made over Cinderella style to take an extra seat at a dinner party they are hosting with their rich friends. Mary falls in love with a rich businessman, Nelson Rogers, played by Forrest Stanley, even though she is unhappily married to an abusive husband played by Clarence Burton. Eventually, Mary is free to marry Nelson and lives happily ever after. The film was a hit, both commercially and critically. Film Daily called Agnes charming. Agnes's portrayal of Mary is, Mary, Mary, Mary is simply astonishing. It is a masterclass in conveying the awkwardness and anxiety that a character feels just day to day in life. You can easily tell that she is in an unhappy marriage and never knows what her husband will do and is grappled with the anxiety even when she's at her job. But when her wealthy employer suggests that she joins them for dinner, it plunges Mary into even further panic. It was such a sharp contrast to the more confident, feisty character that I first saw her play in The Sheik, but more on that character in the next part of this episode. For the sake of time, I'm going to end right now. Please join me in just a moment for Agnes Ayers Part 2. Thank you. <laughs>